I'd like to welcome you all here today to the long-awaited grand opening of the Shotgun House as the Preservation Resource Center for Santa Monica. We're here to celebrate the rehabilitation and adaptive reuse of a very simple structure from our past as a center where all can learn about historic preservation, what it is and how to do it, as well as more about the history of our community. I want to thank the many, many donors and people who contributed all kinds of other um, activities to making this center a success. And just to show you, I'd like everyone who was involved in this from the very beginning when it was first landmarked to raise their hand. Where are board members? Everyone. Thank you. Um, I, I'd like to recognize in particular a few, a few people in the audience and uh, please forgive me if, uh, if I overlook anyone. Um, Peyton Hall is here who was our preservation consultant. Um, Doris Soson, who founded the Conservancy and has made significant contributions to our interpretive program. Uh, let's see, who else? Uh, John Merchak, who painted, who's donated painting of the interior. Cassie from Form LA, um, and many, many others in this audience who helped to make this possible. Up, oh, yes. <laughs> How about Nina? Nina, raise your hand. Nina and Mario, who will be speaking later, have, have really been uh, champions of this project from the very beginning, as well as Cheryl Kushner, who, in addition to everything else, with Libby Motika, I'm sorry, with Libby Pacharis, helped us organize today's event. We have a number of council members and other people who will be making brief uh, remarks this morning. I'd like to recognize former, former Mayor and Councilman Bob Holbrook in the audience. Um, and let's see. Thank you all for everything you did to make this day possible. I now like uh, Reverend Janet McKeithen, Presi uh, President, Minister of the Church of Ocean <laughs> Park, to come up and make a few uh, words of dedication. Thank you. Good morning. As we gather this morning, I'd like us to pause for a moment to remember the many people who made this day possible. This day was made possible by dreams and labor of generous, wise, and courageous members of our community. We, of course, remember this morning Mario Fondo Bernardi, who is the one who initially recognized that the house needed to be saved and brought the issue to OPCO and to the church in Ocean Park and hung strong in there with the project through these, all of these years. We also remember Susan Lockmiller, who is the first shotgun chair and served for many years and protected it alongside Mario, until they finally were had the ability to hand it over to the Conservancy. And Fred Whitlock, who got the approval of the church in Ocean Park. And when the bulldozers were set to bulldoze it down, he got a call at 5 o'clock in the morning and ran down there and put his body on the line so it wouldn't be bulldozed. Yeah, that's the kind of advocacy we're talking about. The work to make this possible took courage, and it took years. The African American Registry says that a shotgun house is a black cultural architectural form that originated in the American South and it's found mainly in African American communities and neighborhoods. Shotgun, the word shotgun, may have originally come about not only due to the structure of the house but also an altered form of togun, the African Yoruba word for house. But the shotgun house was typically used as low-cost housing for low-income workers of the South. So this house is not only an important part of the history of Santa Monica, but of the history of the United States. So, well done. All of you who shared your spirit, your energy, your wisdom, and your time to save this shotgun house and turn it into a place of preservation, education, and community building. Today we celebrate more than a structure. 
We celebrate the twin threads that run through the fabric of Santa Monicans, advocacy and community service. On this date, January 23rd, 2016, we dedicate this shotgun house to those qualities that brought forth this place, advocacy and community service. And we dedicate this shotgun house to the future, preservation, education, and community building. And so in the spirit of love and life, and in the name of all that we in our separate traditions deem holy and sustaining, we bless all those who gather here this morning and we dedicate this shotgun house. May the shotgun house remind us of who we are in this community. May the rich cultural history of the shotgun house remind us of the need to provide reasonable housing. May the building be a tool to continue the good work of preservation, education, and community building. So may it be. Amen. Thank you, Janet. A very inspiring way to start our day. Now I'd like to introduce Mario Fonda Bernardi, who is going to talk to us a bit about the significance of the Shotgun House, our Shotgun House. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Uh, it's really wonderful to see so many friends that have come together for this project uh, over so many years. And it's, I'm glad that you're all gathered here today. So from wigwams to hogans, from log cabins to sod houses, from adobes to double wides, most Americans have always lived in very simple houses. This house is simplicity itself. Three rooms in a row. Okay. Little windows on the side. The gingerbread is only on the front because often they were side by side so you couldn't see the side of the house. So you only, only always put it up here so you can see it on the front of the house. Okay. The walls are made out of one inch thick boards, no studs. Okay. They could be easily erected by a crew of two people and each piece could be lifted up by one person. And as far as we know, this type of house started in New Orleans many centuries ago. And it worked its way up the Mississippi River, it worked its way up the Ohio Valley, and then it went viral over all of the South and the West. And this type of house was very easy to build. And it was so easy to build, eventually they became kit houses. You could buy a shotgun house and a kit with all these funny things already pre-cut. And at that point, you know, if Ikea was around 100 years ago, they would send you a house. You know, some assembly required, batteries not included, but all I had to do was with hand tools, you could put together one of these things, you and your cousins. And because of that, they appeared on farms, they appeared on ranches, they appeared in mining camps, they appeared as barracks, they appeared as vacation resort and youth camps. And often in entire neighborhoods of southern cities, these shotgun houses were vernacular American architecture, right up there with the mobile home. And if you came to Ocean Park 120 years ago, there would be sand dunes here. North of us, about a mile, was a little village called Santa Monica with 1,600 people. And along the beach, there was a boardwalk with little shotgun houses all lined up. And people would rent the lot and build a house. So, you know, it was kind of like, not quite Airbnb, but we were heading in that direction, <laughs> right? And so, you had this, basically, this little strip city here that was basically one row of houses deep. And as time went on, the city fathers that owned the land said, well, wait a minute, we can do much better than that. And they said, in 19, 18, 1902, they said, get rid of these houses. We want to build real houses for real wealthy residents who can pay more money. And so the houses were all evicted. It was the great shotgun diaspora. <laughs> and the people who couldn't buy their lots, they took horses and dragged their houses along here, along 2nd Street and in other places. And then, as time went on, of course, there was a lot of problems with these houses. They were very cute and very small, but try raising a family in one of these. When they started moving from vacation homes to more permanent housing, the walls, one inch thick, you couldn't run wiring through them. You didn't have any studs. You couldn't insulate. You couldn't put plumbing. And so over time, what was once a very common structure became very rare. They ended up on the endangered species list. 
And then the termites came, and they said, mmm, nice soft redwood. All the oils have been baked out by the years, and so a lot of these houses were just sitting on the ground, and so the termites did their thing. The last thing, of course, is we do have to mention fire. In 1902, 1912, there was a big fire in Ocean Park. Six blocks went to the ground. 223 structures went up in smoke in four hours. And, you know, we're standing on this lot here that used to be the fire station. When we dug out for the foundations of this building, we found the old fire station of Ocean Park. It's down below us here somewhere. So this is a long process, and we wouldn't be here without that fire, ironically. So there were very few shotgun houses left. And one of the problems with shotgun houses is not only were they hard to live in, but people started adding on to the front, to the back, above, to the sides, and eventually you would never recognize it as a shotgun house. This is the last intact one. And 16 years ago, this house was also on the chopping block, and some very idealistic activists threw themselves in front of the bulldozers. The back of the house was already chopped away, gone, but the core, the three-bedroom core remained. And the house was saved, and the city stepped in and said, you can put it at the airport, and the odyssey began. The house was moved to the airport, and they built a soccer field. The house was moved to the Fisher Lumber site, and then the, the Fisher Lumber site got converted into the city yards. The house finally came home, right here, just two blocks from where it used to be down the road. And here it is today. And the purpose of this house, of course, is not just to be uh, let's say, architectural nostalgia. The reason we save houses is because when you save a house like this, you are actually moving the ball forward. What you're doing is you're saying, let's do something to this tired old building that solves some real problems. So if we have parking problems, which we do, when this lot here was restriped and rearranged to receive the shotgun house, we put in an extra parking space. There's a shortage of meeting spaces in Ocean Park. This house has been reconfigured with a movable wall. When you go inside, you'll see that, so that it can be used as a meeting space. Is there a water crisis? Absolutely. You are standing on an 800-gallon water tank that collects all of the rainwater from this entire lot and reintroduces it into our water table. And all of these plants here that you see, they're all drought tolerant. A year from now, we are not gonna be watering them anymore. And finally, those of you who are looking down the street, you can see that in fact, all of these little homes line up. And we have done a little bit of urban healing here because at one time, this line of porches extended all the way down Second Street. So we're continuing a little piece of that. Finally, when you restore an old house or an old building, you are curing urban Alzheimer's. And by urban Alzheimer's, I mean if there are no preserved buildings in your city, in your neighborhood, everyone is disassociated, everyone is lost, everyone is confused, everyone is disconnected. So when you restore a building, you're building neighborhood connections. So this building is a seed. It's not a building, it's a seed. It's a seed from which every building that you see around here sprouted. It's the seed that the two big industries in Santa Monica, tourism and real estate, sprouted. And those industries are still keeping us alive today. So you want to look at this as a seed that really is also a root. And so finally, I'd like to say that we're very happy here to reopen this building, adaptively reused for a new purpose, so that all of you can enjoy the benefits of a restored shotgun house and feel connected to your own neighborhood and enjoy this for the shotgun house's next hundred years. <laughs>
We couldn't do have done it without her help at many steps along the way. So thank you, Karen. I'd also like to recognize Cindy Heitzman, of the California, head of the California Preservation Foundation, who's joining us here today for our celebration. Cindy, raise your hand, thanks. Okay, with, with that, I'd like to introduce Councilman Ted Winterer, who's going to talk to us some more about the community's role in saving the house. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I've been asked, as Carol noted, to speak about the community's role in saving and preserving the shotgun house. Uh, to prepare, last night I waded through Nina Fresco's exhaustive, uh, if somewhat pedantic, history of this effort, <laughs> which I commend to all of you. Uh, Nina, where can we find that? Is that in the back of the booklet? Or do you have copies available for sale? Anyway, if you're a wonk, you need to read this thing. But I'll try to just highlight the, the main points. Uh, and before I get into this, to make sure I don't miss anyone who contributed, I'd like to acknowledge everyone here who played a role in this effort. There are various groups who are all instrumental in us being here today, first of which is uh, the late great Ocean Park Community Organization. I see that uh, various members have made their way here from the Opco Retirement Home to be here today. I'm glad to see them here. Uh, the church in Ocean Park, of course. There was, a, uh, for a while, an organization known as Friends of the Shotgun House. There's the Conservancy itself, there's members of the Landmarks Commission, and of course, uh, Karen Gittenberg and everyone else at Community and Cultural Services. So, if you're in any of those organizations, please raise your hand and be acknowledged right now for making this all possible. It really took a lot of people to make us here today. So, as been noted, sometime between 1998 and 1902, the Shotgun House was constructed and it began a contented and simple life by the sea for many decades down the street at 2712 2nd Street. But in 1998, a new owner filed for a demolition permit. It happens to be a time of significant transformation in Ocean Park, once known as Dogtown, but now facing change through rising real estate values and potential loss of historic structures in its essential character. At that point, Mario Fonda Bernardi brings the house potential device to the board of the Ocean Park Community Organization, at that time chaired by Rick Bladotti, who I see here, and they vote in to endeavor to save it. Mario and Susan Lovelock Miller is also over here, spearhead the effort and soon recruit members of the church in Ocean Park to assist. The Landmarks Commission designates the shotgun house as a landmark, but with a loophole. It can be demolished if it's sufficiently documented for posterity. And if reasonable efforts to relocate the building to another site are made without success, demolition can proceed. So the activists scramble to find sites for the house and get bids for moving it, while filing appeal of this loophole to the city council. Soon the house becomes the focus of a citywide debate between those who favor its demolition and those who would save it, part of a broader dialogue about the possibility of Prop A, an anti-landmarks initiative being put before the voters. The council denies the appeal, city staff finds none of the pro proposed new locations for the home adequate, and the property is sold to a new owner with the demolition rights in place. He threatens to sue Opco, and things don't look good for the shotgun house. Then the newly formed Santa Monica Conservancy gets involved. Working with Opco and the Church in Ocean Park as an item is placed on a council agenda to provide a public site for the house. However, the new owner places a dumpster outside the property, he initiates salvage work, and vacillates between ceding to preservationists and bringing in the bulldozer. At this point, activists penetrate the walls in the municipal bureaucracy, and meet with city manager Susan McCarthy, who arranges for a temporary site for the house at Santa Monica Airport, which council's approved. Is Susan here today? She's one of the heroes of all this. So the next morning, this is one of my favorite parts of this story. The next morning, Fred Whitlock, Cheryl Kushner, and Pam Bravra stake out the shotgun house, and, and sure enough, the owner arrives with a bulldozer. So when I'm reading this last night, I have this mental picture a Fred with a shotgun on 2nd Street guarding the house, which to those of you who know Fred is a very incongruous image. But that's what came to mind. And after lengthy negotiations that day, the owner agrees to sell the house to Opco for one dollar. But the problem is there's no dollars to move it. Nina Frescos and others dial for dollars and an angel, still unknown today to most of us, steps in with a loan of nine thousand dollars, only recently repaid. Mario then rushes to City Hall 
to get an oversized moving permit and locates a suitable site at the airport. This is my other favorite part. On July 2nd, 2002, the house is moved to Santa Monica Airport but a man, by a man who had once moved the Spruce Goose. Howard used his legendary World War, wooden World War II plane. So I'm moving the shotgun house seemed pretty simple to him. And is boarded up and secured by Mario and Tom Clays. Fundraising begins immediately, led by Mario, Susan, Nina, Tom, Lori Nashin, and Jamie Zazo. Greatly complicated by Opco's legal and financial challenges, which soon rendered the organization defunct, although the, opt the Opco Shotgun House Committee remains operational for some time thereafter. In 2004, news breaks that the Shotgun House will soon have to move from its site at the airport as construction of Airport Park is imminent. The Main Street Community Gardens has been identified as an ideal site for the house, but the gardeners resist the idea, and so the Rec and Parks Commission vetoes the notion. But the outlook brightens, brightens considerably when the nonprofit Friends of the Shotgun House is formed by Cheryl, Mario, Tom, Nina, and Ruth Ann Lair, and the Conservancy lays a hand with raising funds for a relocation and a historic structure report. With council approval of a new temporary site of Fisher Lumber, the Shotgun House has moved once again in November of 2005. Soon thereafter, the council approves all the funding necessary to prepare this site and to initiate a plan to allow a nonprofit, which turns out to be the Conservancy, to rehab this house and open up a preservation resource center. So things have brightened considerably. The Conservancy then officially votes to take on the Shotgun House project and the Friends of Sunshine, uh, the Shotgun House group is dissolved. And then things just really begin to gather a lot of momentum. The records then note the involvement of Carol Lemline and John Zimmer in various efforts to preserve the Shotgun House as city approvals are granted. And finally, the house is moved to its current site here in March of 2014, traveling, as Mario noted, a net of two blocks in 12 years. <laughs> After many hours of fundraising and rehab work, here we are today, and I couldn't be happier. I'm sure you all share my gratitude for the many long hours of hard work devoted by members of our community, most of whom are here today, for making this moment possible. Thank you. I, I'd like now to introduce uh, Councilman and former Mayor Kevin McCune to, sp to speak about the city's role in preserving the shotgun house. Ted? Kevin. Thank you. I know Santa Monica traffic can be bad, but two blocks in 12 years, that's, that's <laughs> pathetic. Um, I can't help but think that the curved sidewalk here is symbolic because it's been a long and winding road. Uh, and I tend to think in terms of songs, because I used to work in rock radio, so the song running through my head on the way down here this morning was the 1965 Motown classic, Shotgun. <laughs> Now, I think 50 years ago, Junior Walker was actually singing about a shotgun wedding, which is, you know, an event of circumstantial urgency. But there was a lot of circumstantial urgency surrounding what has happened with this house. And I'm really glad and proud to be standing in this house again. Uh, Ted was assigned the community's role. I'm going to talk a little bit about what the council did, although the two were kind of hard to separate, and that's why I say I'm glad to be here again. I was in this house on its original site in 1998, before I was elected to the city council. Now, at that point, I was just an activist, uh, but I've been on the council the whole time that the shotgun house has traveled all over the city to come these two blocks. Uh, back to the neighborhood where it started. And that outcome was not always a certain thing. So I'm gonna do my best now to explain the political intrigue that was happening at City Hall. When I first met the Shotgun House, it had just been purchased by a guy named Forrest King. And Mr. King had no interest in the house, he just wanted the land. So he filed for demolition, which led through the Landmarks Commission to an appeal that came before us at the City Council. And we were in the winter of 1999 able to delay the demolition and buy the house some time. A year and a half later, in September of 2000, it looked like time had run out. Some of us still hoped to keep the house on its original site up 2nd Street here, 
because we were afraid that moving the house might actually destroy it just as much as the demolition. I think it was at that meeting that I said I was afraid that all that kept this shotgun house standing was that the termites were holding hands. <laughs> So we delayed the demolition again. We urged that a buyer be sought for the house. And sure enough, the Ocean Park Community Organization, OPCO, stepped up. And so in July of 2002, four years on now, with some assurance that the house could indeed survive being relocated, the council approved letting OPCO move the house to city-owned land at the airport for temporary storage. Temporary. Little did we know. Three years later, the house is still at the airport on land that we now needed to begin construction of Airport Park. In November of 2005, still on the council, I suggested we move the shotgun house to another city site, and that turned out to be 14th in Colorado, which gave OPCO up to another two years. But things were getting dicey for the shotgun house. The only professional preservationist on the council opposed that move at that time. Within months, the owner of the shotgun house at the time, OPCO, went defunct as a nonprofit organization. Uh, so then it was the Santa Monica Conservancy who picked up the bill for, for the move. But now we had an orphaned shotgun house owned by no one, sitting in limbo at a city storage yard with a two-year clock still ticking on it. In July of 2006, I made a motion that the city itself take ownership of the shotgun house. And again, uh, the council wasn't united, but that motion did pass, and we did go forward. So that brought us to the beginning of the home stretch. Uh, in June of 2007, by barely four votes, it takes four votes out of seven to do something, we barely had the four votes to move the house to this location on Norman Place, that this should be the future home of the shotgun house, and we put out a request for proposals on who would manage it, and in 2010 we signed a lease for this location with the Santa Monica Conservancy. Uh, we tossed in the money to renovate the land, we tossed in the parking lot that you're standing on. The house moved here in 2014 to be run by the Conservancy. It's still owned though by the city of Santa Monica, and actually Mayor Tony Vasquez is going to be here shortly to collect the one dollar annual rent, <laughs> and uh, I hope somebody here has that dollar ready. Thank you. Come on, Kevin, it's not due until June. <laughs> okay, so uh, I, I'd now like to introduce California Senator Ben Allen, our own Santa Monica native in that position now and uh, I think he has a few words to say. Thank you so much. Thank you, Carol. Uh, well, I'm, I'm a, little, a little late to this event today because I had the extraordinary honor and privilege of being able to touch a piece of history this very morning in downtown LA where we heard Co Congressman John Lewis speak uh, to a packed house at the Bonaventure uh, Hotel. And, and he told us about his experience crossing the, the Pettus Bridge and in fact uh, gave us all these wonderful this little uh, little little model of the Edmund Pettus Bridge that, uh, that 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 they crossed on that 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 wild and terrible day of of civil rights and of justice uh, in in Selma, and it, about half the speech ended up hinging on his childhood growing up in a shotgun house uh, that was built just about the same time that this was out down in the deep south. Talked about raising chickens and talked about. Uh, his, his experiences as a little boy growing up uh, in the South in, in a shotgun house like this. And he said, I'm going to go back to that shotgun house. And he said it a couple times. And I thought to myself, I'm about to go back to this <laughs> wonderful shotgun house. And it's my opportunity now to, to, to touch another piece of history, our wonderful local history, this beautiful house that is a symbol of what makes this community so special, uh, both in terms of its, its history, but also in terms of the extraordinary activism and the fight and the work that went into helping to make this a reality that you heard described by our two council members today. This is here not only because of the history of this town, but it's also here because of the extraordinary work done by so many people, and I, I recognize that I see so many folks who work so hard to make this happen, who work so hard to preserve our history. I grew up in this town, went to you know, public schools from K through 12, to, right, ended up at Samuel High, and now it's my honor and privilege to represent and serve this town in the State Senate. 
And I was always a history buff as a little kid, and it's so neat to now know that the next generation of Santa Monicans will have not only a wonderful museum to, to go visit, but a center to come and learn about and, and have preserved the extraordinary history of this wonderful city, this wonderful city that continues to grow and thrive, but also have so much respect for its past and for its heritage. And I just want to say, Thank you from the bottom of my heart to all of those folks here who work so hard to preserve and protect our history in the city of Santa Monica. So it's as a grateful member of this community, but also as a member of the California State Senate that I'd like to present the, Cal the Santa Monica Conservancy with a certificate to honor them, to thank the Conservancy for its extraordinary work in preserving our heritage and history as, as identified, as represented in this wonderful shotgun house. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. <laughs> okay, so okay, so we have one more thing before the ribbon cutting. I would like to uh, ask Nina Fresco to come up and unveil our landmark plaque, which tells you all that this house is officially a landmark of Santa Monica. I invite you to stop by and read it, and we know that it will be here to tell the story to people walking by, uh, if they might be here on days when the house isn't open. So, Nina, if you would perform the unveiling. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now, uh, photo yes, photo op for the actual ribbon cutting of the shotgun house. And um, would one of you like to have the actual scissors? <laughs> and so first, uh, <laughs> you're ruining the illusion. I'm sorry. I, 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 did you figure out how you two are going to hide it up here? Anyway. Um, Ted, if you would, if you would uh, position yourself to cut the. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, as, as you know, the house is rather small, and we won't be able to show all of you through the house at one time. So we have a number of other activities that will be taking place. Um, it's posted over here, and I think there's a second poster back over this way to tell you what's happening. Um, we are offering a tour of some of the local landmarks. Um, which will start from over here ne near the sign. We'll be uh, collecting people to go through the house over on this side. We have refreshments here behind all the bottles of water you can see. And beginning at noon, our band will be playing, our bluegrass band. Um, so we hope that you will all enjoy the rest of the day, that you'll see the house, that you'll learn a little bit about Santa Monica's history and its landmarks. And, oh, and there are also kids' activities um, there that are taking place, including a scavenger hunt. If you take them along with you on the tour, there will be some things for you to do and uh, for them to do and a prize at the end. So... Thank you very much for coming. This is the end of the formal part of the program, and have a great day.